Hello and welcome to the all new City Ad Talking Points with me, James Horncastle. From now on, there'll be just one show a week bringing you everything you need to know from Italy. First, we're going to look back at selection of the weekend's games. I'm going to concentrate on the plight of Palm and then we're going to look ahead at the key games to come. It was a big weekend at the top of the table. Eusebio Di Francesco, the ex-Roman midfielder, did his old team a favour by masterminding a draw for Sassuolo against the Champions and League leaders, Juventus. But on the whiteboard before the game, in the dressing room, he wrote, I believe. And his Sassuolo players certainly played with belief. They also played with more energy uh, than Juventus, who were less aggressive and less hungry than we've become accustomed to. Sassuolo played a 3-4-3, a new system for them. It meant they had three strikers going up against Juventus's three centre-backs, so they couldn't play out to Andrea Pirlo. Simone Zaza opened the scoring for Sassuolo, like he did in this fixture last season. But unlike then, Juventus didn't come back and win. Paul Pogba equalised. He had a chance to win it, but he didn't. All they could muster was a draw. The Mape Stadium remains a bogey ground for Massimiliano Allegri. He lost his Milan job after losing 4-2 here in January. But if you were to tell him he was going to start his Juventus career with six wins and a draw, I think he'd take that. Roma's 3-0 win against Chievo closed the gap at the top to just a single point. Their three strikers, Mattia Destro, Adam Laic and Francesco Totti, all got off the mark and they wrapped things up inside half an hour, allowing Rudy Garcia to rest and rotate his team ahead of Tuesday night's game against Bayern Munich. Before this game, Garcia had said, we will win the Scudetto, of that I'm sure, and belief is growing at Roma. They left that 3-2 uh, defeat against Juventus before the international break, feeling superior to the champions, not inferior. As for Chievo, this defeat brought the dismissal of Eugenio Carini. He was replaced by another board manager, Rolando Moran, and there seems to be a bit of a pattern to their managerial appointments. Asked if he would have sacked Walter Mazzari by now, Inter's former president and minority shareholder, Massimo Moratti, said, I'm a bad example. I sacked a coach two days after he won the Scudetto. That was Roberto Mancini. It wasn't the greatest vote of confidence in Walter Mazzari, his last appointment as president. Inter came back twice from behind against Napoli, showing real character, which you know, answered some of the critics about their mental fragility. Pierre Auxilio, the director of sport, said, look, Mazzari is safe as far as we're concerned. If he gets back into the Champions League, he'll definitely be in the job uh, next year. If he gets into the Europa League again, we'll probably have a chat. If he misses out in, on Europe altogether, well, then he's probably gone. What's gone wrong at Parma? Last year, they were a revelation. It was their centenary. They broke several club records, including going on a 17-match unbeaten run, which was only interrupted uh, by Juventus. They finished sixth overall, but the Fiji T actually took away their qualification for the Europa League and gave it to Torino on account of a financial irregularity. That injustice was supposed to serve as motivation going into this season, but Parma seemed unable to lift themselves out of depression. Sunday's defeat to Atalanta in the dying minutes was their fourth in a row, and it roots them to the bottom of the table. This is their worst start to a season in their history in the top flight. The ultras who travelled to Bergamo demanded an explanation uh, from the Parma players, which is always an unedifying spectacle. Um, so what's happened? Well, yeah, it doesn't really help that uh, Parma have lost several key players, either to injury or to other clubs. Gabby Paletta, the Italy international centre-back who went to the World Cup this summer, has undergone surgery. Marco Parola, who got so many goals for them and assists uh, from midfield, has instead uh, moved to Lazio. Jonathan Biabiani, arguably the fastest player uh, in Serie A, a great winger for them. Well, yeah, he's had to put his career temporarily on hold uh, after a cardiac arrhythmia uh, was detected. And Amaury, uh, their striker, who's so important when it comes to holding up the play and bringing others into play, well, he moved to Torino. Sunday's game against Sassuolo is big enough on its own because it's a local rivalry. These are two clubs from the same region, Emilia-Romagna, uh, but they are both in relegation trouble. And Parma and Donadoni definitely need a result to start turning things around. The upcoming weekend in Serie A is another exciting one. We're going to kick off with Lazio against Torino. Lazio are really beginning to come together. I'm not just talking about the team's Serbian and Albanian players after that drone flag controversy uh, during the international break. Uh, their win against Fiorentina on Sunday was their third on the spin. Bosman free transfer Filip Djordjevic uh, scored his fifth goal in three games for the Bianco Celesti. So often in the past, their Champions League hopes have faltered um, when Miroslav Klose has got injured around the new year. Klose concedes he probably won't get back in the team now because Djordjevic is doing so well. Torino have an informed striker of their own in Fabio Quagliarella. He scored five in his last five games for the Granata. They've all but forgotten um, Ciro Immobile, who moved 
uh, to Borussia Dortmund. So this game will probably have a bearing on the European places and it will probably have a bearing on the, who wins the golden boot in Serie A as well. Fiorentina have enjoyed their recent visits to San Siro. Uh, they've won on their last three trips to play Milan at the Miazza. In fact, there was a lot of speculation at one point about owner Silvio Berlusconi paying the release clause in Vincenzo Montella's contract and appointing him uh, in charge of the Rossoneri. Instead, he went with Pippo Inzaghi and that is going very well for him indeed. Milan are up in fourth, they've won back to back. And Keske Honda is in great form. He's been supercharged under Super Pippo. He scored six goals. He's top of the scoring charts with Callejon and Carlos Tevez. This game promises to be a cracker because in Milan, we've got the best attack and in Fiorentina on the day, one of the best footballing sides in Serie A. Sinisa Mihailovic describes Sunday's 2-2 draw with Cagliari as being like a defeat because Samp had been 2-0 up um, through an inventive set piece finished by Manolo Gabbiadini, got his fifth goal in six games and a screamer from Pedro Obiang. Samp are still up in third place, they're still unbeaten, they've got a mean defence, only Juventus have conceded fewer goals than them uh, this season and they'll be hoping to take advantage of any tiredness Roma might feel following their midweek game against Bayern uh, on Saturday. So that's the end of the City Hour show this week. Uh, if you want to discuss any of the talking points we raise, do so in the comments section below. Also, if you've got any questions uh, for me, tweet me. I'll try and answer them um, in this in next week's show. We'll be back on Tuesday. Remember, also on the channel, which you can subscribe to by clicking here, uh, there are also the Liga shows from Andy Brassel, a Bundesliga show uh, from Raphael Honigstein, a Ligue 1 show uh, from Julien Laurence. I'll be back uh, next Tuesday, so I'll see you there and ciao for now.